Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Anthony R. West. For those of you that don't know me, I was the project manager on the 1981 to 2010 climate normal. And primarily, that was um, looking at temperature and precipitation, snowfall. So we'll take like a 30-year average, that type of thing. We do this every 10 years. Frost and freeze impacts are such a big deal that we have a special supplement just for it. And I'm going to go over that today with you. So takeaway messages. If you get four things out of this talk, these are the things. We've heard this a lot. Frost and freeze events are costly and dangerous. Frost and freeze products are based on select minimum temperature thresholds, and I'll go over that in the next slide. We provide a wide variety of products that characterize not only the climatological likelihood of frost and freeze occurring, but the timing of them as well. And lastly, uh, since 1951, the median freeze-free period over the United States on average, in a bullet, actually in a median sense, it's increased by about a week. So we heard Tammy kind of earlier give some definitions, what's frost and what's freeze, and I want to take that a step further. Uh, these are very technical terms. Um, they're physical processes, and we're not putting thermometers in tomatoes or potholes. That's not what we're doing. You know, we have them at airports. We have volunteer network measuring temperature. So I just want to make that clear. You know, we are doing this on air temperature, primarily minimum temperature. Okay? And what we do is we provide a wide variety of thresholds because plants and other you know, processes depend on different um, temperature thresholds that are near the freezing temperature of water. So when we say frost freeze, you know, we're not talking about the process. We're talking about temperatures near 32 all the way down to 16. So I want to show you some results right away, and I picked nine stations based on where everyone said they were from for this first up. So these are frost and freeze Dayton holes for 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so we, let's start with Ithaca. So the probability of getting down to 32 degrees at least once in the year in Ithaca is 100%. Actually, that's the case for all of these. So what we want to know is the timing. The timing is very critical. When can you start planning stuff? If you want to look at an immediate sense in the spring, half of the time your last freeze event will occur May 14 per before. Half of the time it will be after that. So that's the median perspective. Let's say you want to get your crop to market early and you're willing to take a 10% or a 90% chance that You'll, you'll get uh, freezing conditions after that. You can start something in a, on April 30th, maybe just one or two, you know, crops or fields out of your, you know, entire farm. And then guess what? If it doesn't happen, then you're first to market. So this is really kind of a risk perspective here. You know, we provide these at the 10th, 50th, and 90th percentiles. On the flip side, we have fall. When is the first fall freeze occurring? So for Ithaca, the average date or the median date is October 3rd, um, if you really want to risk it, you can try to you know, get in two crops, for example, by October 17th. Uh, for Charleston, you know, these dates are a little bit earlier in the spring and later in the fall. It's a warmer station. You're going to have a longer growing season. Uh, Kansas City is kind of in between. Let's see. Yeah, so half of the time the first frost freeze will occur October 23rd. There we go in Kansas City uh, the other half of the time after that. Uh, we have Bellevue here again, same kind of thing. Uh, actually, Bellevue and Manhattan are only 170 miles apart, and you see that their uh, frost freeze dates are, are very close to each other. <coughs> Houston is a warmer station. This annual probability of occurrence is 94%. That means we don't expect it to hit 32 at least once you know, all the time. There are some years where you never get down to 32. Um, another thing to notice about Houston is when we get into warmer stations like Houston, these dates are not really in the spring or fall. They're actually in December, January, and February, and these ranges kind of intersect with each other. They're not clearly separated um, seasons anymore. See the same kind of thing here for Peoria. You see this, this is happening in the winter. There's only an 89% chance of hitting 32 in Peoria in any given year. Um, for all of this analysis, we define the cold season as August 1st through uh, July 31st. 
Now, some stations are too cold or too warm to compute dates. For example, Miami, Florida, where I'm from, um, at, at 32 degrees, it happens maybe 3% of the year. So that's not enough data for us to provide dates for. Other stations are, are cold year-round. They, they can be 32 degrees in July or August. Uh, what's the station in New Hampshire, Mount Washington? That's one of the stations that it's too cold for us to compute dates. OK, so here is a overview of the frost and freeze related products that we have. We have probabilities of occurrence, both at monthly and annual scale, probability dates, growing season less normal, and all of these are for these temperatures right here, 16 to 36. We also have something called frequencies of partial exceedance. I'll go over that as well. That was actually part of our traditional normals release, and it's for these temperatures. And Rocky Bellotta is going to go over the air freezing index. So this is just like a 40,000 foot view of the methodology. I don't want to get into the details. Happy to answer questions on the details if there are any. But I just want everyone to know that frost and freeze dates in particular are very noisy parameters. You could have one year where you only get a freeze once. Maybe it's October. Maybe it's February. Year to year, the variability of this first and last occurrence, is, it, it's just crazy. When I first looked at it, I was very surprised how noisy it was. It's also very sensitive to missing data. You know, if you have time series for a year in October to November, you know, but what do you do? It might have reached freezing during that time, so we need serially complete data to do this type of analysis. So there's basically three steps that we do to compute these uh, parameters. First step is to fill in any missing holes that we have in the minimum temperature data for 1981 and 2010. Okay. Then what we do is we take 29 full cold seasons that we have filled in, and from that we produce 10,000 simulations of annual time series. And then only when we have those simulations do we compute the statistics. And this essentially kind of smooths out any kind of jaggedness you might get from only using 29 years in combination with a very noisy parameter. So I'm going to go in through the products right now. We have probabilities of occurrence. This is actually a new component of the supplemental normals. We haven't done this before. So it's essentially the likelihood that a given minimum temperature will be experienced at least once during the month or the year. Uh, for example, in Minneapolis, which I have not gone to for this reason, there's a 100% chance that you'll drop down to 16 or below at least once in the year. They have an indoor ball. <laughs> you got to walk outside and get through it. <laughs> but this is the kicker for me is that in April, next month, there's an 18.7% chance that you can get down to 16. Sometime in April in Minneapolis. That's just crazy to me. Like I said, I'm from Miami, Florida. There's only a 16% chance in any given year that you'll get down to 36, just 36. Um, so again, if, if there's a less, like for Miami at 32 degrees, this is actually less than 10%. So for that, Example, we wouldn't even provide dates. You know, we, we don't provide dates if it's less than 10%. Anthony, I got a question. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you talked about the 29 years being not significant, right? How many years do you think uh, we would need to get a reasonable average that's considered climate normal? Well, for the traditional normals that we have, when you're talking about things like averages, like we produced in 2011, like the, the traditional 1981 to 2010 climate normal, when you talk about averages, you know, that is okay. But when you start talking about things like what's the first date of something occurring, and it could be so variable throughout a year, and then trying to average over that, it's just not, it's just a very noisy parameter. So what we did was, you know, we, we made that into 10,000 to be important. It's, like, you can get a result if you use the 29 years, and we looked at them, and we're like, wow, these things are just very jagged. Let's smooth it out. Let's increase the confidence that we have in that. I don't know if you'd get any better result using 100 or whatever with bootstrapping. You don't even have to worry about it. You just, you know, create 10,000 or 100,000 if you prefer, and it spits out the information. Does that answer your question? Yeah, kind of, yeah. Thank you. Okay. I'll say kind of. <laughs> All right, so probability of the 32 degree Fahrenheit occurrence. Um, these are the nine stations that we saw earlier. I guess I've organized them from coldest in the sense of, you know, 
this time of year for the cold season. So Missoula is pretty much our coldest station that we included here. Um, you're going to get it, you know, at least once a year, at least once in October, at least once in January, at least once in April. On the flip side, we look at um, Peoria. This is not Peoria, Illinois. This is Peoria, Arizona. 89% um, of the time of years, you'll get at least once. But look at January. Only 56% 50 of January is where you get down to 32. October and April don't bet on it. It's Where's zero. Peoria, Arizona. I'm sorry? Where is Peoria, Arizona? I'm going to ask the previous snake climatologist from Arizona. Is it the Phoenix metropolitan? It's just northwest of Phoenix, I believe. <laughs> So Kansas City is kind of in, in the middle here. 76% of October's will get down to 32, 88% of April's will get down. And this is just one. I just want to stress that this is just one. So for Kansas City, we wanted to zoom in and actually show that, you know, we're not just doing this 32, which, you know, is a freezing temperature of water. But again, many processes out there, you know, maybe 24 is important for pest control or for, or, for pipes freezing, uh, freezing that, that type of thing. So we'll do this for 16 through 36. For Kansas City, all of these probabilities are 100%. But as you see, um, as you increase the temperature, these spring dates get later and later and later. Kind of makes intuitive sense. In the fall, these dates get early and early and earlier. You know, you're, you're going to hit 36 before you hit 16. You know, makes sense. Uh, we have. I also wanted to stress that these things are, these state normals are now computed as conditional probabilities. This is a new thing. What we would have done before is we would have given you, actually we wouldn't have explicitly told you, but we would have, um, the probability is 68% of this happening. What we would have done before is we would have only given you six states instead of nine, and we would have said those last three dates, oh, don't worry about it. It doesn't happen all the time. What we wanted to do was actually give you more information. So we give you this now, the probability that it, that it even occurs. And then, provided it does occur, these are what the 90th, 50th, and 10th percent dates would be. So we're actually giving you more information, stretching out this cold season to give you more information. And I should stress, this only affects a minority of the warmer stations where this value is not 100%. <coughs> For the other stations, like Minneapolis, less than, you know, it's so cold there, um, it doesn't change the values at all because it's a 100% chance. So we don't compute this, like I said, if the probability of occurrence is too low. Affects very warm stations in Florida, Texas, Pacific, Puerto Rico, et cetera. That's also new. And we also, like for that station in New Hampshire, Mount Washington, you know, before we would actually just produce dates, just whatever came out. It, 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 it could be really close to the beginning of our cold season, August 1st, or the end, July 31st, and, you know, you're kind of like, what do I do with that information? Now what we do is that, if we don't have, if it's just too cold of a station, we say, hey, there's year-round risk of freeze. So don't bother trying to plan anything, basically. Growing season length normals, uh, this is also known as freeze-free period normals on the forms that we produce. So this is kind of a similar thing as what we're showing, except instead of looking at other cold season first and last, we're just trying to say, like, from spring to fall, how many days would you expect it to be above 32? So it's that kind of probability. So the growing season is just simply defined as that time period between the last spring frost freeze and the first autumn frost or freeze. So the growing season length normals is just that likelihood that the growing season will be at least that number of days long. So for Houston, we see the median is about 320 days. On the flip side, our coldest station, Missoula, you're only expecting 128 days for a growing season. And this is what this looks like for Denver, Colorado. This is the form that you get that Stewart will be, I don't think Stewart yet, but Stewart will be coming in here and discussing this. And then if you blow it up for, a, let's see, the 10th through 50th percentiles, you see that for Denver, I guess for 36 degrees, you can expect 133 days a year to be, in, you know, consecutively above 32, 233 in a row if you're talking about 16 we also have this piece called frequencies of threshold exceedance. Again, this was part of our conventional normal release. So it's pretty much it's how many days you would expect in a month or a year to be below a given temperature. 
So if we take uh, Cleveland, for example, how many days in January would you expect the max temp to stay above 32? So it's, it's about 13, right? So how many days would you expect the minimum temperature to drop below 32? It's about 25 days. So the annual and the monthly probability of this occurring in Phoenix is 100%. It's going to happen. It doesn't mean it's happening every single day in that month. So I want to stress that. You're getting two different pieces of information here. Also, what this is telling you is that you have 13 days where, um, let's see, both the maximum and the minimum stay below 32. That means you never get above 32, 13 days. You have 12 days, the difference here, where the max gets above 32, but the low doesn't. And then by deduction, you have six days on average where they're both, they both stay above 32. Okay, so it's not as miserable as you might think. All right, so we wanted to show some kind of climate change impacts for these phenological dates. So what we did is we computed the date normals for 1951 to 1980 using the same exact methodology that we used for 81 to 2010. Okay, so I color coded this in a very simple way so that you can see the overall pattern. So if the date changed by more than one, it's red. If it, if it changed in a negative direction by more than one, it's in blue. If there was a little change, you know, like a day or zero days, it's five and gray. Okay, so let's see. This is fall freeze date. So if we have a positive value for the fall, that means that the date is later, which means it's like warmer. It's like you have more time to fit in that last crop before the first freeze comes day. So that's why it's plotted in red. So what we're seeing, and again, we're ignoring the stations and, you know, these parts where it's either too cold or too warm to produce dates. So if you look at the median of these red dots, it's about plus five days. You know, basically just the, the first the fall freeze date is five days in a median sense further. Okay? Look at the median of the blue dots, it's negative three days. There's not too many of them. Okay, and we see that the blue dots are kind of clustered in the central part of the US, whereas, you know, much of the east is red and the northern tier as well. Okay. So if you take the median of all these values plotted here, we get about three and a half days longer warm season in terms of, you know, time in the fall that you can, you know, fit in extra time for planting crops, for example. On the flip side, we have the spring. Okay. So now, if the date is earlier now, that's actually considered warming because it means that that last uh, ascent in the spring is actually earlier. So these are negative values. These are plotted as red now. Blue means um, you have an extension of the cold season into the spring. And so we're seeing a slightly uh, different pattern. Uh, we have uh, much of the east, especially the northeast, is warm in the northern part. Um, we have some cooling here, and actually now the southeast where we are is actually a mixed bag. Um, on average, um, the red dots, again, just like last time, are averaging the median of the red dots is about five. Now the median of the blue dots is actually about negative two. So once again, we're seeing a three and a half day shift. So overall, in the median, this is a week total extension of the growing season, if you will. So, yes. question on the slide, just so I can accurately capture this. Overall, the median is negative three and a half days, meaning growing season starting sooner. Yes. And that it's getting warmer sooner. Yes. The risk of getting below 32 is, yeah. Okay. And if I'm located in a specific region in the U.S., so let's just say because we're in Asheville, North Carolina, mm -hmm. if you were to zoom in to your chart, and we wanted to really understand the statistics for, say, a sub-region, Western North Carolina region, we could find that information um, similarly by following the same process that you just did. Right. Okay. Absolutely. So we also have, uh, this is a product that was actually released in 2011. It's climate-related planting zones. And I can't read this caveat, but, you know, I think those are the USDA thing, but we did this as kind of, you know, to help um, with the APGA as, as 
American Public Gardens Association. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> Um, so we provided these, and um, let's see, we're showing we're showing the difference between 1971 and 2000. What these normals would be um, based on these ranges that correspond with different planting zones, and what they are from 1981 to 2010. And what we see in the difference is that you know these zones are kind of moving up ever so gradually. When we go and um, forecast the next 30 years, what we see is that these zones have been shifting up a lot more. So actually, I guess North Carolina, where we are, we're actually getting to zone 7, whereas before, much of Western North Carolina was actually fluctuating between 6 and 7. So, you know, this is, this is a clear impact of how, you know, minimum temperature and that trend that we're seeing. Yeah? I'm sorry? Based on the model or I believe what they did was they forecasted the trend from 71 and 2010 forward through 2011 to 2040. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, it was just it was a very simple thing actually suggested by Tom Carl where you did a least squares regression line to the 71 to 2010 period and extrapolate that out into the future just to give a sense that if historical trends continue, how would things change? It would not apply. Was there another hand? Okay. So just to wrap up here, um, these agricultural normals were released earlier this year. The flagship way to access these normals is climate data online and Stuart Institute. Right. We'll be presenting on this, and I'm going to hurry up before my voice goes. And also order. Uh, Go to NTDC orders, that's our user engagement services grants, either by telephone or email to get access. And also there's FTP access as well if you're interested. And again, these were supplements to you know with 1981 to 2010 climate normals. And I just want to stress these four uh, key takeaway messages. Again, frost and freeze events, costly and dangerous. That's why you know we spent the time based on user feedback to actually include these in the normal. Um, frost and these. Uh, Products are based on select minimum temperature thresholds. Again, so we're not putting thermometers in tomatoes. We're actually just measuring the temperature, minimum temperature based products. And we provide a wide variety of products to help characterize the climatological likelihood and timing of the event. And we just saw we're seeing about a week increase in the growing seasons. 